Uh, hello, this is Fred Bird from Park Supercenter, Program Manager for our Motors Program. Um, welcome, thanks for joining our webinar <clears throat> discussing vertical pump motors, um, what's unique about them, um, what to know, how to talk intelligently to customers and end users, what, to, what is unique about vertical motors that you have in your, uh, your facility uh, that you may not be aware of. So we're going to wait another minute uh, for a few more attendees to join. So uh, we'll be right back to you in about a minute. Thanks for joining. Okay, and we'll um, we'll kick things off again. My name is Fred Bird. I work for the uh, Rexel Parts Super Center, and I've been a program manager for four years for our motors program. Um, prior to that, I had 28 years of experience with the GE Motors business, and really, the um, my thought of uh, putting this webinar on was um, based out of let's say apprehension I had in my prior job with, with GE Motors. I was in OEM sales, very um, specific, mostly to horizontal frame, uh, either NEMA size or larger motors. And when I came across opportunities for pump motors, either in the true verticals, either in the replacement or with some OEM applications, I was always apprehensive uh, because it's a specialty product uh, that there's only a few manufacturers that make a true vertical. And there's really some design specifics for the pump applications. So I thought this would be a good time for everybody to, to you know, to learn what those specifics are, so you don't have the apprehension um, to sell into this marketplace or to assist customers and have this product. Uh, the number one application of NEMA frame AC motors is on pumps, pumping water, pumping other fluids. Um, so. It's a great product to know and application to know. And again, there's only uh, a handful of motor OEMs that build a true vertical motor. Um, but I'd like to, um, to get started with a little bit of background. Um, the GE Wulong product built out of Monterey, Mexico. Um, uh, GE sold their industrial NEMA frame motor business uh, to the Wulong Group. Uh, back in 2019. So uh, all the production has been, prior to that, had been consolidated into Monterey, Mexico. And the, the vertical motors is specifically built in San Jose, California, Owensboro, Kentucky. Um, all the design records and manufacturability uh, and parts manufacturability, that all resides in the, uh, the GE Wulong Monterey facility. Um, so I'd like to introduce, we have, we'll have two panelists with us today. Uh, the first, Esteban Nagalazmu, and he's an application engineer who works out of the GE Wulong facility in Monterey, Mexico. Uh, he's been there 12 years, various roles, manufacturing engineering, test engineering, field application engineering, um, and his last role was the engineering technical leader. So he's going to be leading the presentation. Um, we're going to keep it specific to vertical motors. This is across manufacturers. Um, so we want to keep it useful for whether you have a GE vertical in your facility or another brand. So uh, then joining us a little bit later will be Lonnie Hebert. And Lonnie joined GE the same year I did back in 1988 with the motors business. Um, he has over 46 years of experience. Everything from own his, owning his own rewind service shop to field application engineering with the GE Motors business, uh, distributor, OEM sales, uh, and a training role. So, uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Esteban to lead the presentation. Thank you. Okay, th thank you, Fred. Uh, we'll talk yeah. about today about the vertical pump motors, as mentioned by, by Fred. Uh, we would like just to differentiate this from horizontal motors mounted in vertical position because the construction is different and the, the specific of those are different as well. So we'll go through the through the details of the 
vertical motors. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the horizontal motors and uh, and what is uh, required for specifying one or the other. So we'll start with uh, where the vertical motors are used. Uh, the vertical pump motors uh, were initially uh, being used for uh, water treatment and irrigation, but nowadays it's being used all over all over the place, all over the countries uh, for in many industries, uh, industrial facilities, for every single industry where we have some uh, uh, some need of moving water or any other liquid from one place to the other. Uh, in the picture shown right now in the screen, you can see uh, some of our, our power motors uh, installed in the field. You'll see here 500 frame WP2 machines. You will have TFC machines uh, on the outside, and you might have also hollow shaft WP1 motors uh, in the inside. Uh, here is just showing the, the specifics of a, of a pump shaft uh, extension in, in one of our hollow shaft motors. So just the construction between the verticals and the horizontal machine is different. So we will allow you to present just the, uh, some of the main difference between those. Uh, here we decided to put a quick uh, table showing the, the things that are in common or that you need to ask when you're specifying or you're trying to uh, understand what is a vertical and a horizontal machine. As you see, we have in common uh, many stuff, I mean, at least six, seven points. Uh, but there are some other specifics on the bottom that are really for vertical motors only. So we'll go in detail through those. We'll, I will talk just quickly about the ones that are in common so we understand what those are. So about the application load curve, that is something that uh, would be ideal to have. Um, most of the time uh, that is not available, so we can do some assumption depending on the on the application that the customer has. But having the load curve uh, help us to have, uh, uh, making sure that there will be good separation between the load curve and the motor curve. So making sure that there will be no issues while the motor is running or starting, uh, making sure that if the, if the customer will start the motor at a different voltage rate, uh, different than the rated one, there will be no issues on torque or, or on the heating in general of the motor. So having that is 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 good and is it will be very beneficial for the for the design and the finishing of the motor they need. Uh, in, as mentioned, in some cases it's not available, but we can do some assumptions on making sure that the customer is fully aware of those. Uh, now talking about the power or the HP, that is actually what you buy. Is this a 100 HP motor, 200 HP motor? I decided just to put some note there to identify what the brake horsepower is, uh, the BHP versus the motor horsepower. Uh, the brake horsepower for pump uh, motors uh, is basically what is the what the the pump needs. I mean the real power going to the pump, uh, not necessarily the power uh, used by the motor. Uh, that is 100% related with the design of the pump you have. Uh, it's it taking into consideration some stuff about the flow rate, the pressure, and the efficiency of the pump. Uh, most of the time, what the customer uh, supply is just uh, they are fully aware of the brake horsepower required, and they ask for 10% more of those. So we just provide a motor that is uh, between the rating that they need. Now, talking about the speed or the number of folds, that is just basically the, the the rotation of the shaft and how how far the shaft will rotate. If it is a four pole, it will be 1800, or if it is a two pole, that will be 3600 RPM. So it's just critical as well for the application. I mean, we don't want to have a, a six pole motor running in a four pole application. Uh, there might cause some overheating and mechanical damages on the on the equipment. So we need to be fully aware of of the speed and uh, that is required on the application and by the customer. So that is critical for both horizontal and vertical. Uh, voltage and frequency is critical as well. Uh, the voltage will determine if you will have uh, the type of insulation system you might have. If it is a low voltage, you will have a random wound. Uh, anything below 1,000 volts, you have 2,300 volts or above, you might get a, you will get a, a form coil or a rectangular wire uh, type of insulation uh, on your on your stators. Uh, Knowing that is critical, and also will be critical to know if there will be any any variation during the operation, if the customer will uh, use a different voltage than rated during the startup and so on, so we can just take that into consideration as well as frequency. I mean, motor the speed is 100% related with the frequency of operation. It will not run at the same speed at 60 or 50 hertz. So having that into consideration is, is for sure critical. Now talking about the enclosure, uh, just quickly, that is uh, the main construction of the motor, uh, the protection that it will have depending on where the motor is installed. It might be a TFC machine uh, for the outside, 
a WP2 machine on a big a big motor, 500 frame, for example, uh, that you'll have on the outside and will have some filters or maybe a WP1 uh, that will have no, not a big external protection, but might be used for the indoors or some specific applications. Uh, uh, having that into consideration will be important just to uh, ensure the longevity of the motor and making sure there will be no external conditions that might cause some service problem on the machine. Uh, about the service factor, the service factor is just basically the additional overload that the motor is designed for. Uh, for example, if you have 100 HP with a 1.15 service factor, you have that additional 15 uh, HP to run the motor continuously without uh, creating a degradation on the insulation system. Uh, on that point, that it will be critical to know also about the other, other conditions like the ambient and the altitude to make, to make customer aware if they could run at 1.0 or 1.15 or any other uh, service factor, depending on the conditions they have. And also might my, my represent uh, or might need to uh, put into consideration the, F, the insulation temperature rise that I might be B or F right, depending on, on the conditions. Now moving to the really what we are will be discussing today about the vertical motors. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the shaft. Uh, we have different construction than horizontal. We might have solid or hollow shaft. I uh, will go in detail through this on, on the next slide. We might we will need to know the the truss of the actual force that will be present in in the application. We need to know if it will be up up or down or both. Uh, the magnitude of that truss uh, in pound. Uh, if it will be monetary or or, or constant. Uh, we'll need to know what is the, uh, the bearing life expected by the customer, the minimum bearing life uh, uh, designation, uh, the P-base dimension, that is uh, we have different dimensions depending on, on the customer need that align with our frame size uh, offering as well. And also about the coupling, that will be critical for hollow shaft machines mainly, uh, but there might be requirements for solid shaft as well. So we'll go in detail on these ones in the following slides. So we'll start with what the hollow and solid shaft is. Uh, shoulder shaft motor is uh, is something very similar to what you see in a horizontal machine. So you will have a shaft extension at the bottom. Uh, the only difference is you might see a, a small machining at the, at the end that is being used for for the installation of the slip rings when you are installing the motor hub and the key. Uh, but you will have a shaft extension similar to what you have on a horizontal machine. Uh, the dimensions for sure will be aligned with the type of, of motor that you have and the trail requirement as well. Now for hollow shaft machine, that is a, a motor that works a little bit different. Uh, normally what we call the drive-in, uh, the, the part where the shaft is connected with the application. So for horizontal, so we see the, the, the right way where we have the shaft extension, similar for totally shaft machines. But in hollow shaft motors, the, the customer shaft or the application shaft will pass through the motor and you will connect it in the pop, in the top. So the shaft uh, goes inside of the motor, hollow shaft and couples at the top of the motor, you will have some arrangement there that you will, you will see in the next slides uh, that will help you to understand how it's connected. So now the drive end is really the top of the of the motor, and the coupling is helping us to transmit the torque uh, to the pump. Uh, about the truss loads, uh, I mean the truss load, is, as mentioned, is just the actual force that we will have in the motor. Uh, most of the time, uh, the force and direction of uh, the force and the direction of it. Will that will dictate the type of of truss bearing that we will use, uh, and that will be required to obtain a, a, a to have an optimum performance and the expected service life of the machines. So in the industry, there are some truss uh, definition that has been standardized. Uh, we may have uh, motors where there is little or no external truss that we normally call no, normal truss. We might have inline application where we have moderate axial and radial up and down thrust. Those are specific motors that have a, a purpose on the operation for moving uh, liquid and viscous uh, liquids on, on the pipelines. Uh, we also have high thrust that uh, those have a very high down thrust capability uh, where we need to know the 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 recommend uh, the, rec the need for the customer from the customer on this so we can specify based on that. The, the design of of the motor and the bearings that they might that might be required. So, in general, just the, the truss rating comes from the truss bearings we use uh, in the upper housing. Uh, normally, this is a configuration that you will see in a high truss machine. Uh, you have a guy bearing on the bottom and the high truss on the top. This is an example of a DFC solid shaft solid shaft machine. 
and the thrust bearings might be angular contact or spherical roller. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more uh, on the next on the next slide as well. So we decided to put this uh, uh, nomenclature about the frames because we consider this is useful. I mean, not only for G product, but you might see this also on, on some of the other uh, manufacturers. So what we have in the nomenclature is basically the frame size uh, followed by a, a letter that normally helps us to to identify the shaft and the truss type. Uh, that might be hollow shaft, high truss, if you see a T, a B, if it is a solid shaft and high truss, an H, if you have a solid shaft, normal truss, and an L, if you have a solid shaft, inline truss. Uh, I will show you in the next slides also about a little bit about the bearing design and what makes it a little bit different. Uh, then we have a, a P that is giving us reference that this is a vertical motor with a P base. The P base is the the base that is in use on the motor to mount with the palm head. It has a, a female axis here and a, a female rabbit and, a, and a, a will match with the male rabbit on the palm head. So it will help us to maintain this align and concentric. And then at the end, uh, you might you will see a, a, a base diameter that will help you to identify the diameter of this base uh, depending on the on the customer need. Uh, talking about the bearing life, uh, the bearing life is uh, is a, a term that is used to specify the average lifespan of a bearing that is following the ABMA prefer uh, method. ABMA is the American Bearing Manufacturing Association. So this is a, a, a sim in simple term is 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 just uh, calculating with 90% reliability how many hours a bearing will last under given load and speed. So we decided to put just the formula not for you to to memorize. There might, you might not use it in the in the application because that is coming from from manufacturer and from the engineering of the motors. But what we wanted to make reference here is that it's 100% related with the type of bearing that you have. So for example, the bearing dynamic capacity. It is coming for a bearing catalog, depending on the type of bearing you're using. The same bearing that with the bearing truss factor, uh, and the, and then up from the application, we need to know the force or the truss applied, uh, plus the weight of the motor that we are that we are uh, using, and for sure the speed that we discussed at the beginning that it is critical for the definition of of the motor. Uh, we also decided to put a, a quick reference about uh, a common nameplate designations for bearings. Uh, the most the most common one the, the the ones that are more common are the ABMA nameplate designation, but we might have also the SKF designations. We decided to put this one because it's a question that we got all the time. Uh, just how how can you identify that based on the on the designation that you see on the bearing? So uh, this information is giving you the the dimensions of the bearing, the bearing type as well. Uh, some I mentioned some critical series dimensions. And some other modification or feature that it might have, it might have. Uh, it is really common in 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 our cases that customer ask us to have a an additional play showing this information. So we considered it was going to be useful for you uh, on this. This is only used for is used for not only vertical but also horizontal machines. So it's good information to have in hand in case needed. Uh, now that we will move to the uh, bearing uh, design or the bearing. Uh, consideration we have depending on the truss type for vertical motors. Uh, I would like to just to reinforce some considerations we need to have on the application and the request um, in the request from our customers. So uh, the one that is critical is the motor speed. We just talked about it. If it will be a two, a four pole or a six pole or any other. Uh, the truss load, the magnitude and the direction. I mean, how much truss we are expecting to have on the application in pounds. Uh, it will be up or down or both. Uh, the minimum bearing life expected by the customer. Uh, there are cases that we specify uh, one uh, one GRL 10 life bearing life, uh, but the customer sometimes they they want it five years. So we have to design uh, uh, on neither the type of bearing or the quantity of bearings uh, that we will use for trust. So we could meet the, the customer requirements. So that is something to, that is needed to be taken into consideration. As well as the bearing cooling requirements for bearing uh, for motors that are uh, big, like 500 frame, uh, high HP, uh, with high truss requirement, there might be additional cooling required on the motor. So there might be uh, cases where, where you need a cooling coil. So we need to to be in, uh, I mean, being in agreement between the customer and the and the manufacturer about uh, the type of cooling coil that will be supplied, and making sure that the customer has 
uh, the installations and have the facilities for, for supplying water to the motor and what type of water they will use. If they will use soft water or, or breakfast water. So we can define the type of cooling coil required. So I, that is also critical for us to know, uh, for any manufacturer to know. Uh, so we can just uh, select the proper cooling system for the for the motor to make sure that it will last. And at the end, just the type of bearings that that we will be used that is for sure critical on the on the vertical motors. <clears throat> so vertical motors might or might not include the actual truss bearing, depending on the truss requirement. So we have this type of motor that are called normal truss. On these motors, there's little or no external truss. Uh, these motors are using uh, regular ball bearings on both sides. On the guide bearing and on the top bearing, we will use uh, a ball bearing, a regular one. Uh, it will be normally lubricated with grease. Uh, we consider that in these applications, are there are no bearing losses to impact efficiency. Uh, for high truss machines, we need to take that into consideration in our designs so we can meet the, the efficiency required by the motor. So we need to take that in, into the playing into a role of efficiency. Uh, where these motors are used are, are basically in applications where you have simple water transfer pumps like a shallow well or pond or air conditioning or cooling towers. Uh, now that we will move to the high truss, I will add just to, to, to say that when we have a motor uh, with a bearing system with truss provisions, uh, we need to make sure that the, the bearing is designed to hold that that, that truss requirement. So, uh, the bearing and the the bearing system need to be designed to carry uh, three main points that are the ro the rotor weight. I mean, the weight of the rotor that will be supplied with this with this uh, motor, uh, the dead weight of the rotating pump shaft and the impeller or the impellers. So, also about the uh, the pump hydraulic truss that you might see in the application. So all that needs to be taken into consideration uh, when designing uh, or selecting the type of bearing that will be used. Uh, we also need to know that uh, that the bearing needs to withstand some percentage of, of momentary obstruct. The regular uh, obstruct, momentary obstruct that is uh, specified is 30%. Uh, we need to make sure that with the arrangement we select, we, we could have uh, some reasonable life, as mentioned, one year, L10 life is, is the normal or standard offering for high trust, but some water might be an, uh, uh, requested by the customer, so we need to analyze that and design the motor for that requirement. Uh, we need to make sure that the, the bearing system maintains good radial stability, and we need to make sure that also that at the end, uh, the, the machine it has a, an e it's easy to serve, so we could be maintained properly. So for high trust machines, we have uh, two type of, of bearings. We have angular contact bearings and the spherical roller bearings. The angular contact bearings looks like a regular ball bearing, but the difference that you will see it has a, a 15 degree angle. The reason for that is that we are trying to translate the radial loading to axial loading. So it might be up or down. So it has a one single direction thrust capability, but it could be accommodated in tandem or stacked together. So you can have uh, uh, a combination of up and down truss. Uh, in the picture that you see there, for example, we have a, a one down with a spacer, but also, I mean, in, in a different configuration, you might have two down and one up. So you can just have some some consideration for the momentary obstruct that you might have. Uh, for the spherical roller bearings, again, those look like a cylindrical roller bearing that you will see in horizontal belted applications, but the difference is Again, that we will have a 15 degree angle inclination that will help us to have a, a, a translating again the, the radial loading to axial loading. Uh, somewhat different on this one is that you have uh, some contour that will help you to have more area of con axial loading. So on the angular contact, you have a, a single point of contact, but in the spherical roll, you have a line. You see the surface is, is having more contact with the with rays. So, is making more more is, is helping us to having a higher rating for trust. So angular contact bearings are normally on for truss loads on 8,000 pounds range. The spherical roller bearings are used in the range of 15,000 pounds. Uh, we could have these some um, hollow and solid shaft design. So that might be a requirement from the customer either have one or the other. I mean here I'm showing you just a quick uh, reference of of the previous image, but showing you all the assembly parts. 
uh, you might see the guy bearing on the bottom. This is a solid shaft on the top. Uh, just the two configuration we mentioned, and in this case, this is a TFC machine with no coupling on the top, uh, and you can see the housing and everything related to the TFC construction. Uh, moving to the inline, the inline is a different type of uh, of uh, high thrust uh, or pump motors. So we have in this case a moderal, moderate axial up and down external thrust. Uh, these type of pump pumps are really popular in the oil, in the petrochemical industry, and those are uh, mounted in line with the pipeline. That's why those are called in line. So you see the these two pipes here and how the motor is connected in line with it. Uh, we have you you have more than normally have more than one uh, motor in the in the in the pipeline. You have three, four, or more uh, that are helping you to move uh, viscous uh, liquids through it. So, uh, you might it might be the case that depending on the viscosity, if you have four pumps, uh, you might be using only three. Uh, the fourth one will see all the uptrust uh, just by seeing the, the the liquid passing through the pump. Uh, some of the characteristics of this is that you have the the, the discharge and the inlet uh, uh, flanges uh, in line. So you see a representation in here, and the impeller is connected directly with the shaft. Uh, it is very easy for installation, as mentioned. So if you had a, a horizontal motor, you will need a base and, a, and many other features to make these connections. So for for these uh, inline pumps, it's really easy for the installation. So it's been used in distribution and booster pumping uh, for some circulated uh, circulating system. Uh, I've mentioned it's installed directly in the pipeline, uh, has a strong uh, radial and axial forces that might be applied for uh, on the motor shaft. So the motor is designed for for that characteristics. Uh, the difference with the other one is that in this one we are using a, a double row angular contact truss bearing. So it has the capability of doing up and down truss. So you might see that represented here in the diagram, the, the up and down truss, uh, just by the, the arrows that you see there in the in the bearing. Uh, other type, of, uh, here is just another representation of the same motor uh, with this uh, configuration on a TFC machine. Uh, other type of pumps that are also widely used in the industry are sewage pumps. Uh, those are used, but uh, what the name says for sewage and and, and rainwater. Uh, so th the the main characteristic of this one is that uh, this motor might be subjected to very high axial and radial external thrust shock loading, and that is because there you might see during the on the pumping of rainwater uh, you might see or sewage water you might see a lot of solids on, on, on the water. So you might see that shock uh, during the uh, the operation of the machine. You have, again, a double row angular contact bearing. Uh, this is a very specific and very special motor. Uh, it has some, uh, sometimes it has some exotic shaft material, a special shaft diameter, uh, uh, in some cases, extra long shaft, uh, which is common requirement from customer. Uh, in our cases, it's only uh, designed for the WP1 construction. And it's having also a one-year uh, L10 bearing life. Uh, the application, as mentioned, is just on on two edge pumps, uh, close uh, close uh, couple and non clock pumps. Uh, it moves uh, thicker fluids, and is widely used in food processing and some pumps. Uh, now talking about a little bit about lubrication, uh, I wanted just to emphasize about the the importance of this. I mean, the main purpose of the lubrication is to form like a film between the bearing components. So there, to make sure that there's no metal to metal contact. So uh, having a good lubrication is critical for the for the extended bearing life of the motor. So when we talk about the L10 bearing life, that is taken into consideration ideal conditions. But in reality, you know that uh, all the all the, the the maintenance and all the the care we take on the motor and the bearings will make us will help us to have a longer life on on the bearing on the bearing. Uh, bearing and motor uh, expected longevity. So three of the main uh, 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 principal uh, functions of the lubrication is one, to reduce the, the friction and the wear between parts. Uh, it's helping us also to protect against corrosion. So also helping us to seal against uh, any any contamination that we may have uh, that might affect the bearing. So we decided to put this on the screen just to show you uh, some of the common ones we use, I mean, that is being used uh, not only for us but also in the in the industry in general. We have greases for some of the bearings. 
uh, mostly on the vertical motors, you might see grease on the on the guide bearing, so the one on the bottom. Uh, the, the one on the top might require oil lubrication. So in here we are putting the two types that is mainly used for, for vertical, depending on the type of bearings we have. Uh, we always recommend to follow the, the instruction manual to know how, how often you need to lubricate and the type of lubrication that you need to use. Uh, additionally, I mean, this is specific for our product, but wanted to make the point that uh, for vertical motors, we understand, I mean, in general, we understand how critical the lubrication is. For horizontal and vertical motors, you will see the lubrication required on the nameplate. And additionally, on the vertical motors, we install a tag on, on the motor that is helping you to not only making you aware that you need to read the instruction book, but it's also including uh, some, a list of manufacturer uh, and the common designation for the oil. Uh, for both ISO 32, 150, and we're including another one that is the 68. So this is really useful for customers when they have uh, uh, they have to select the type of oil being used, and they rely 100% on, on whatever is available in their location. So having a list on hand of of, of the manufacturers and the oil designation we consider is is critical. So we wanted just to make make that point. Uh, you be aware of that. Uh, we will move now to, to some specifics about the vertical hollow shaft motors, since we are moving now to the part of, of what the couplings are. Uh, first, I decided just to put in the screen a, a representation of a 449 WP1 machine. Uh, this is how it looks on the on the outside. You might see here in the bottom the P base and the top cap, and this is just the inlet and outlet uh, air provisions on the motor. Uh, on the inside, you will see the the main parts of the assembly. So I wanted just to focus on, on the one that I mark in yellow, uh, since we want to be talking about the coupling. Uh, here is a, this is a good representation of how the, the assembly looks. Uh, for the truss bearing, normally the bearings are mounted on a, what we call a lower half coupling. So the lower half coupling is installed on the top of the motor, and you have a stand pipe, and normally you have a, an oil chamber here that is helping you with the lubrication. Uh, the upper half coupling is connected on the top, so it's making a connection between the lower and the upper half coupling through some hard work. In this case, we've been shown a, a, the upper half coupling and also a non-reverse system with a bolt style design. Uh, you can see here the representation of the truss bearing as well. In this case, it's a spherical roller. Uh, on the bottom, you have the P-base. That is just the base that we have been talking about. And you might or not be required to have an stabilizer bushing to help you uh, to maintain an, uh, uh, a straight uh, assembly and help you with the whip on, um, on the operation of the motors. Uh, this is another good picture of, of how a, a hollow shaft application looks like. Uh, on the left side, you see a motor that is installed already on the pump. Uh, on the right side, you see the, the pump head and the application shaft. So this application shaft is being used to connect at the top of the motor, to connect the rotor shaft with the with the application shaft where you have all the impellers or other systems you might have here on the pump. So uh, this shaft has a threaded portion at the top where you make a connection with this uh, top coupling. You will have a nut connecting this at the top and you will have some other bolts to secure that in position. So this dimension from the top of the coupling to the base is normally what we call a CD dimensions. Uh, I will show you some, some other reference in the next slide, but. I, we wanted just to put this uh, on you, in front of you so you can have this uh, a clear uh, image of how it looks. Uh, the pump shaft, as mentioned, goes right through the motor. So that's why it is, we need to have a hollow shaft design. And the base, the P base of the motor need to match with the pump head uh, dimension. So the dimension, the diameter of this base need to match with this one. So it will be uh, specified by customer and we can just supply base it on that might be 12, 16, 20, 24, or any other, depending on the frame designation and the offering for that one. Uh, we'll move to the type of couplings that we have for, for vertical hollow shaft machines. Uh, so uh, the coupling, as mentioned, the main, the main function of this is to transmit the torque uh, to the pump. So we have three, three different type of couplings. Uh, the first one that is, uh, we wouldn't say the cheapest one or the easiest one is the self-release coupling. Uh, it has two main characteristics that is uh, is not able to carry up thrust and is providing some, we can call reverse rotation protection, but it's, it's mainly just the fact that uh, this, this coupling is 
is connecting uh, this type of coupling is connecting the lower half coupling and the upper half coupling through these dry pins. So uh, when there is a a, a, a fall condition at the, at the at the motor or there is any re fade reversal on the application, what it will do is that the shaft will start to to unscrew. So it will uh, the pins will start to unscrew. So we will uh, release the shaft from from the coupling. So that will avoid the motor, the the motor to, or the rotor to to rotate in an non-desired uh, rotation. So the thing on this one is that in most of the cases the customers call for 30% momentary uptrust. So that means that the coupling uh, must be coupled to the to the lower, to the rotor shaft. So in that case, it is we are not uh, we cannot use this type of coupling. So there might be an issue when these these dry pins has a coupling because someone will need to come and um, remove the top cover and do, redo the assembly of this one. So normally this air release coupling is used on on this on a small uh, uh, when you have a small column of water. We can say 10 to 14 feet uh, deep well uh, applications. Uh, this is our presentation on how it looks. You can see the the dry pins connected with the lower half coupling showing in pink there, and the top coupling uh, shown in yellow and how it is connected with the application shaft so it will start to unscrew and will release this portion of the of the assembly uh, of course if after this is removed you someone need to come and redo the assembly so uh, there's not uh, there's some reward required on this one so or, other type of coupling is the bolted coupling It's similar to the cell release but instead of having drive pins it's using cap screws it it has the capability of carrying up thrust that we don't have in the previous one but it has no reverse rotation since it is just connected with the with the rotor shaft. Uh, again, our representation of this uh, is shown here in the screen, showing the main components of the assembly. Uh, the non-reverse coupling is being used when you have uh, uh, the need of having reverse rotation protection, and you need the, the need, you have the need of carrying up thrust. This is one of the most popular or the most common type of, of coupling we got requests from in the industry, and and also, this could be used in, in a solid shaft machine if required. If, if by any means that the, the customer needs to have a reverse protection on a solid shaft, it could be installed as well. Uh, again, this is a, a having a two-part uh, coupling, uh, a top coupling uh, connected with the lower half coupling through bolts. But additionally, you will have a ratchet plate that might be uh, for bolts or pin style design. Uh, we have those two available right now for, for some of our products. Uh, most of our offering is right now in, in the bowl design, uh, mainly on the 320 to 449 frame, and we are migrating that to the 500 frame. The pin style is still being used in the small offering, uh, uh, 280 to 210, 10 to 280 frame, uh, but we are transitioning to the bowl design as well because of, uh, of, the, of the new design that has been uh, released for these products. Uh, uh, this, this ratchet device and this combination of Wall carrier or pin carrier will help us to avoid rotation when the motor is is in a different uh, uh, is rotating in a different condition than what we wanted. So you what you can see in the in the screen right now. I mean, if the motor is rotating counterclockwise, it will the bolts will will go in in and out. If it is doing in a in a reverse rotation or in a clockwise uh, rotation, it will get stuck in this in this slot. So I will show you some some other uh, reference about this this non-reverse coupling because it's, it's, it's important for you to know uh, how it works. This, this is an example of uh, how a pin style looks like. Uh, this is uh, an example for a small motor, uh, 280. So you can see here the pin carrier, that is this device shown in the screen. We have the pins and a set of springs inside uh, that is uh, maintaining plate with this retaining plate. Uh, and then we have the ratchet plate, which is mounted on the top of the end shield of, of, on the top of the motor. So as it is rotating in counterclockwise, you will see the pin going up and down, up and down, up and down. So when it is on a reverse rotation, it will get stuck in this step. So that is how, how it works. So when you first start the motor, you will hear the click, 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 click on the application or motor running. And then when it, uh, when, as it accelerates, the centrifugal force will make it uh, maintain lift. Uh, also, here are showing the main components of of the assembly. Uh, we have hardware to connect the the top coupling with the lower half coupling. Hardware to maintain the ratchet plate to the end shield, 
uh, some other hardware to maintain the imposition, the, the, the retaining plate, and the uh, uh, to maintain to secure the, the assembly of these of these two parts, the pin and the spring, and a gift key that for sure is critical on the hollow shaft machines to connect the coupling uh, with the application shaft. Uh, here's an example of a ball style design. Uh, on this one, as mentioned, in difference to the to the pin style, instead of going up and down, is moving. Uh, is, is instead of going up and down, is moving in and out. Uh, when depending on the centrifugal force of this, so we have two main components. That is the the ball the ball carrier uh, and the coupling. The coupling again is connecting the 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 top coupling with the lower half coupling, so we can have a connection with the rotor and the motor. Uh, the gift kit to connect this assembly with the application shaft and the bolt carrier hold, uh, holding the steel bolts uh, and the other component required for the for the reverse non reverse protection. Uh, the ratchet plate again is is mounted on the top of the motor, normally on, on I mean on the end shield, so that is in position all, all the time. Uh, some application picture that we consider will be useful for you. Uh, in here in the screen is shown just the pump head. Uh, you can see this male uh, rabbit that it should match with the P-base. Uh, this hole that should match with the P-base as well. Uh, neither the P-base or this one are threaded, so you just put the bolt here to connect these two pieces. And you have the application fact connecting, application shaft connecting with the impeller. Uh, this is how it, the motor looks when it is installed on the field. You can see the motor and the application shaft. Uh, this is how it looks at the, when it is connected on the top. You can see here in the screen the gift key that is making that connection between the coupling and the application shaft. And then that is secure with a, with a nut. Uh, in this case, you are, you are, we are using a, a non-reverse ratchet with bolt style design. And then at the end, you put just a, a bolt, some bolts to secure this nut in position and those match with this uh, threaded hole we have on top of the coupling. Uh, some critical dimensions that, uh, that you see need to be aware of for both the couplings and the motors are shown in the screen. We'll start with the coupling. Uh, the two main critical dimensions that you need to be taking into consideration when you specify or you are uh, trying to understand what you have in the in the field is uh, the BX dimension, that is uh, the diameter of the bore in the top drive coupling for the hollow shaft motors. Uh, it should be aligned with the application shaft that you have in the field. So this is a requirement from our customers depending on what they have installed or what they're gonna be using. Uh, the other dimension is the EW, that is just the, the width of the ring roof or the gift head key, key seat. That is basically the dimension where the, the gift key will be sitting on. Uh, some other dimensions that are uh, the same between hollow and solid shaft. You can see the CD dimension, that is just the, the dimension from the, uh, from the base to the top coupling. The BD dimension, that is the diameter of the P base. Uh, some other dimensions around the P-base that I will show you more in the next slide. Uh, I want you to make you also reference about the solid shaft motors. I mean, the dimensions about the shaft and this machining that I was telling you about that is being used for the installation of a split rings uh, that are useful for the mounting of the motor hub when you are coupling this with the, with the pump. Uh, the other critical dimensions on the P-base are, are shown in the screen. I mean, BD dimension, as mentioned, is just the the diameter of the P base, so the diameter of this base that will be matching with the with the rabbit uh, that you have on the with, will match with the pump head uh, diameter that you have. The AJ that is the 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 bolt circle. I mean the the dimension between the center of the two holes uh, from the P base. The AK that is the rabbit diameter that should match with the pump head diameter. Uh, and also BF, that is the size of the of the holes on the flange, that again are those are not threaded, are just uh, uh, pass through holes that uh, will match with the pump uh, head and will need to be put putting bolts on that for securing that in position, and will help you to maintain everything concentric uh, on the assembly. So all these vertical motors are mounted with with the P base, so that is a characteristic of these pump motors. Um, that is all all I have right now. So. I guess we will leave the space now for, for any questions. Yes, and uh, yeah, Esteban, hey, I, I would like to thank you for your explanation. I thought it was a, I think it's great when you have these cutaways. And, you know, when we're in the parts business or the services business, a lot of times we um, were described what the part is by its name. 
uh, be it a pin carrier or a ratchet plate. Um, so to be able to see the part in a cutaway kind of view and describe its function, I mean, I think it really helps uh, end users. It helps our uh, channel partners who are out selling. It helps our inside sales team. Um, so really appreciate that and the details on, you know, what a hollow shaft motor, what the real purpose of it is in the application and so forth. So uh, thank you. I just, I did want to let everybody know this session is being recorded and it'll be posted onto our website so you can reference it at a later date uh, without any issue. So um, Rachel, if you want to uh, chime in, if there's any questions. Hello, yes, we do have a few questions. The first question is, what is the purpose slash benefit of having Shaft Connect at the top? Well, the Shaft Connected at the top, I mean, back in the days it was defined. I mean, we used to have the the truss bearings on the on the on the pump. So after the, the industry decided that it was be better to have it on the motor, it was decided to have it on the top so you can have access to it and you serve it uh, in an easy and better way. So you can leave you can leave the pump uh, assembled in its uh, in its installation and just remove the motor from the top in that regard. You don't have to mess around with the pump impeller at all exactly, yeah. or the pump housing. And sometimes the pumps are actually submerged in a, a liquid in the fluid that they're pumping. So and in that case, you can work on it uh, above the water line. Perfect, thank you both. The next question is, are P-based dimensions standard through the industry? What, what are the dimensions? I mean, we have many depending on the frame size. I mean, we have 12, 16.5, uh, 24, yeah. 30. I mean, we have different ones. Uh, if you want, Fred, I can just get the lease and send that to you so we can distribute with the team. Sure, but they are they are, um, they are are standardized um, through NEMA guidelines, isn't that correct? Yeah, this is Lonnie, uh, that's mm -hmm. absolutely correct. Per frame size, you usually have two, maybe three different P-based dimensions. So if you've got a 320 frame, you may have a, uh, you may have a 12 inch, a 16 inch and a 24 inch that would fit that frame. But most manufacturers uh, uh, standardize on on a certain on a certain P-base size, but uh, but the size themselves are all standard. So if it's a 12 inch, it's a 12 inch. Uh, it, it's all the same. The AJ, uh, all of those dimensions are going to be the same. And, and also, it is critical in the application to know. I mean, the P-base dimension might make a an effect on what is called the RCF, the read critical frequency. So that is also aligned with the customer requirement. We might have, as Loni mentioned, we might have three offerings, three, three offerings for the same frame size, but having the different dimension of it might make an effect on the resonance of the system. So we just provide that information to the customer so they are fully aware of that. And of course, the dimension that will need to match with their palm design. Perfect, thank you guys. Uh, the next question, is when a vertical mower is, or excuse me, when a vertical mower, motor with a non-reverse ratchet is serviced in a shop, is it recommended practice to replace the pins and springs? Uh, I'll take that. Uh, uh, in my experience, it, it's a mechanical device, so it, it really just depends on the wear of the springs. In most cases, the balls do not wear, but the springs might. Uh, now, if you have a, uh, I mean, a pin, uh, the springs are used in a pin uh, configuration. The balls don't actually have the springs. They just work off of the centrifugal force. So I, I would say in most cases, if you do have the pin uh, devices, that the springs would be, would more than likely be the part that would, uh, uh, that would wear out. But it would be a visible sign that you could see that it's rusted. It's there's something that's keeping it from 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 its action because it works off a centrifugal force. So you 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 it would be visible if you would need to uh, replace it. 
Perfect. Yeah, as Thank you. Lo Loni mentioned, you need to be checked periodically. I mean, when you're doing maintenance, you review the conditions. So we can make sure that the, the functionality of the system is still working. There's no corrosion or anything. Perfect. Thank you. The next question is, does GEIM still offer wound rotor vertical motors, which were sold into many wastewater plants over the years? Uh, <clears throat> I think the answer to that is no. Uh, depending on frame size, we may have on very large, very large uh, applications, we may have some designs, but uh, really the wound rotor uh, motors have been replaced with variable speed drives. So it, it's an older technology. It's, uh, uh, I think it may still be available, very, very expensive to, uh, to use. Uh, but uh, on your smaller motors, I would say 500 frame and below, the answer to that would probably be no. Perfect. Our next question is, what is highest HP motor currently offered by GEIM? I'm going to say that uh, with the increase of the medium voltage uh, that we've done just within the last year or so, we probably go up to about 1,750 horsepower in, uh, uh, in our Monterey facility. And you can see on the screen now some of the other facilities that Wolong uh, actually uh, owns, uh, you know, you're into the 50, 60,000 horsepower range. Great, thank you. Our next question is the stabilizer bushing noted as optional. What this, what is the function of this part and what kind of issues does it prevent by having it in place? Uh, Esteban kind of talked about that a little bit. Uh, it, it, it's, it is just what it says it is. It's, it's, it's to stabilize your shaft and keep that whipping motion that may occur if you didn't have that stabilizer bushing. So you've got your pump shaft that's connected to your, your motor shaft, and that's all it does is it keeps it concentric, it keeps it, it just keeps it in line. It stabilizes its, uh, its, its position. Yeah, it's trying to, to have like a mechanically, mechanical stability of a solid shaft motor. So as mentioned by Loni, just helping us to uh, to eliminate any possible shaft whip that might that might cause uh, vibration or any injury of on 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 the motor application. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Uh, the final question that we have is: Vertical motors seem like they have many special bearing configurations. Any recommendation on insulated bearings? Any history of bearing issues specific to vertical motors? running on VFDs. I would say that uh, using uh, using an insulated bearing uh, uh, on a VFD application, especially in your larger horsepowers, 100 horsepower and above, uh, along with uh, along with a grounding brush or a grounding ring uh, is is I would say it, it's it's almost um, uh, something that you should you should always specify when you're using a VFD. Uh, if you if you're running across the line, that's not going to be an issue at all. But when you're using a when you're using a variable frequency drive, especially on your higher horsepowers, that's got long lead lengths out there, uh, we see lots of um, lots of issues. Uh, with windings, with shaft currents, uh, with um, uh, just issues that that the drives uh, cause the the motors. So I, I would say that if I'm uh, going to be installing a VFD with a larger motor, uh, I would always require uh, insulated bearings and a grounding, uh, some kind of grounding system, either a brush or a ring. Yeah, and, and for the high thrust motors also, I mean. It's, uh... Instead of insulated the bearing, we insulate the, the the lower half coupling where the motor is mounted. So on the high thrust machines, we we insulate the 
the lower half coupling on the top, uh, we put a shaft grounding ring on the bottom. And that will help us to avoid that uh, shaft voltage and curing that Loni just talked about. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so we actually just had one more question yeah. come in. Is a 1.15 service factor required for VFD applications or are all of those vertical motors okay for introverter duty? Inverter duty, excuse me. Well, the application is actually, <clears throat> it's, it's limited, the power is limited to the drive. So that's why in a lot of cases, uh, you'll see that if a motor is uh, designed uh, uh, for VFD applications, it's, it's designed at 1.0 service factor. Now the motor may be 1.15 service factor as built and would be fine across the line, but uh, in, in normal cases, the way it's designed and uh, the way it is um, uh, specified is a 1.0 service factor. And usually that's the limitation of the drive. Uh, if you were gonna run your motor at 1.15, you may not have enough drive uh, to do that. So the limitation is usually the drive, not the motor. Perfect. Thank all of, thanks to all of you who are answering answering those questions for us. Um, I think that concludes the webinar. Uh, I put the link for our upcoming webinar in the chat if anybody is interested in signing up. Our one of our team members will be hosting that on Vapor Trans. So if you guys have any additional questions, feel free to put it in the chat before we end the webinar or send us an email at sales at pscparts.com. And we can probably help you out and get that question answered as well as getting any type of quote that you might need for your parts. Fred, did you have any words right. before we ended the webinar? Just, yeah, I would just like to thank again, uh, thank Lonnie and, and Esteban for, uh, for joining, presenting and um, giving us all an education. Um, like I said in the, the announcement of this webinar, sometimes you're presented with an opportunity for vertical motors and it's kind of a panic uh, because there's different, there's specialty things about them and you might not be familiar with it. Um, so to learn it when you're not in a panic mode situation is always helpful. Uh, so I appreciate them uh, joining and educating us all. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. And everybody, if you could expect an email coming from us soon, probably by the end of this week, with a Q&A section of this webinar, as well as a recording that you can share with your team members. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you.